I also see that Bernie Reinerson from the Community College Board just joined us. Thank you for being here, Bernie. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Jeff Johnson. Uh, Jeff is a geospatial engineer with uh, Boundless Geo. They changed their name. Um, and he's also the head of our local brigade of Code for America. And Jeff is going to talk to you about open source uh, software today. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a pretty terrible public speaker in this six and a half minute format. It's going to give me a rough time here. But anyway, th hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I had prepared a pretty long, interesting talk about open source business models and how they're in the process of dramatically changing the landscape of IT, but I totally found it impossible to fit into six and a half minutes. So um, I backed up a little bit and I want to provide a sort of a short primer on open source and feel free to ask for the longer version over beer later. Um, so first of all, uh, let's talk about the basics here. What the heck is open source software? And that's a perfectly logical question for someone who isn't a technologist. Um, and so a good explanation is, is in order. So but before that, I want let, to let's make sure we're clear about what software is. Um, software is written by people like me um, who take a set of requirements and uh, write computer code that lets people perform a set of tasks on their desktop PC or in their web browser or on their mobile device. And so you're now all probably very familiar with apps that you have on your smartphone or your tablet, and this is software, just like the clunky antiquated apps you use at work, the one like Gabby showed with the green screen of death. Um, so back to my previous question, what's open source software? Um, and most, um, maybe all of, all for some of you, of the software that you use is developed by a single company that keeps the code or instructions private and considers them its proprietary private property. Open source software is different insofar as the code that makes up the programs is freely available for anyone, including you, if you're so inclined, to open it up, see how it works, make changes to it, or pay somebody to else to make changes for it on your behalf. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with Wikipedia, which operates on a similar model. Maybe some of you are familiar with OpenStreetMap. It also works the same way. If you see something inaccurate in Wikipedia, you're free to change it. Um, and if you see something that's missing, you should probably add it. Um, so if you're not a scientist or a software developer, it may be really difficult to understand why anyone would write open source software. I'm going too fast here, I'll slow down. <laughs> Wikipedia. Um, so anyway, um, if you're not a developer, you know, you might wonder why anybody would write open source software and how could anyone make a living by giving things away for free? And my mother-in-law asked me this quite often. Um, so, being that there are now companies that are based on open source software, including my own employer, you may wonder how these companies could possibly pay their employees when they give things away for free. Um, it makes perfect sense that uh, people, especially for people that work in risk averse organizations, um, that they're wary of free things. It's only proper caution to check for Trojans when you get a horse. Um, the trick here is to think of things in very, very different terms, so let's back up a bit. Traditionally, if you or your organization had a set of requirements for a piece of software, you had really two options. You could find something that wholly or partially met your requirements, and you could pay the company that sold it uh, for a copy or for many copies, and you, or you could hire somebody that uh, creates something for you from scratch that you would then own. But if you took the first path, um, you're now wholly dependent on that company for support. Um, if you need to get bugs fixed, or if you need to add features, or if you know, any, anything you need to change, you, you've got to go back to that vendor. And if at some point you decided that you weren't happy with this vendor, um, your choices would be to bail on them and start the process all over again or just grin and bear it. And I think most of you find yourselves in that situation every single day. Um, if you took the second path, you would of course be dependent upon whoever you hired to write the software for you to do these same things. But since you now own the software, you could of course hire somebody else to do it for you. Open source really provides a, a third option here with a very different monetization scheme. Companies like mine give you the software for free, but they charge you for this whole product. Um, for support, for services, for training, for bug fixes, all the software we work on is also worked on by lots of other companies, um, consultants and other individuals. We don't own the intellectual property for that. It's usually held in, in trust by a foundation. So if you decided you liked the software, but you didn't like us, um, you could take your business somewhere else and keep the same software. Um, and that's really liberating. So you might ask, who the hell would pay for free software? And the answer might surprise you. Let's start with the biggest organization on the planet. The US Department of Defense and the intelligence community are making a wholesale shift to open source from the top to the bottom, from software used by boots on the ground to databases storing and searching all the stuff that you keep hearing about in the news. Uh, they believe that not only is it less costly and provides a better return on, your, on investment, but they also believe that organizations like mine uh, can innovate faster, fix bugs quicker, and provide better support than the proprietary incumbents. 
Companies like Red Hat, which is the biggest open source vendor in the world, they have companies all over the world, including lots and lots of local governments that deploy their software for mission critical applications because they believe it's the right investment for their organization. It's also really, really important to note that companies like Amazon and Google and Facebook and things that you use every day, Twitter, um, are built almost entirely on open source software. They may not open source all their own code, but the building blocks of their infrastructure are almost entirely built on software that you and your organizations could also use for free. And many of them contribute to lots of large and growing open source projects. Um, the Economist, which is of course uh, the sort of arbiter of free market economics, um, has looked into this phenomenon a few times and declared that open source software has won the argument. Um, they state it's now generally accepted that the future will, be, will involve a blend of proprietary and open source software. I think that's pretty powerful um, coming from a, a publication like The Economist. So let's look at this in, with a more concrete example. Back in the, little, uh, in the middle of the last decade, TriMet, which is the agency that manages transit up in Portland, um, faced this same dilemma that I brought up earlier. It's uh, often referred to as the buy versus build dilemma. They looked at all the commercial options available and they decided that none of them really met their needs and more importantly, none of them seemed like a good investment. So they went down the path of building something themselves. And luckily they had some very, very innovative leaders who decided that what they built should be open source and not only should it be open source, but that they should reach out to other similar organizations who face the same challenges. And together with other transit agencies, they created a software called Open Trip Planner. Um, and it's, uh, it's now in use in 10 countries all over the world. New features are being added every day. And uh, this means that if MTA, MTS or Sandag decided they wanted to deploy, uh, uh, here I'm getting, going too fast, or going too slow. If they want to deploy a multimodal trip planner, um, they could try it out for free and uh, they could add software to it. And if, again, they could switch vendors. This all leads, leads to the most important point I want to leave you with. We call this software freedom. This is the kind of freedom uh, that Mel Gibson's talking about here or that we celebrate in early July. When you buy software from a proprietary um, vendor, and especially um, when it's a huge acquisition, you're sort of stuck. The company has you buy the, well, let's just say that you have a few options other than finding a similar vendor. So when you invest in open source, you're free. You're free to change vendors. You're free to make changes to the software like as you see fit. You're free to find someone to fix bugs for you or to fix them yourself. And so when you think of free software, think of it as free as in free speech, not free as in free beer. But of course, all software developers like free beer, so I'll shut up now. <laughs>